Just like having relevant and accurate information is necessary to make sound, hiring, and lending decisions, being engaged in our community is important. Datafax is proud to support the positives and be a sponsor of The Spark. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance is honored to serve the Memphis community for over 60 years. We've always focused on supporting our community and believe in promoting the positives, encouraging engagement, and leading by example. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance is proud to be a presenting sponsor of The Spark. Additional funding for The Spark is provided by Christian Brothers University, Mueller Industries, Meriton, United Way of the Mid-South, My Town Movers, My Town Roofing, My Town Miracles, and by Serves. This month on The Spark, our theme is Progress is in the Air. We'll learn more about a nonprofit cultivating future leaders in the movement for educational equity and excellence, an organization that funds multiple sclerosis research while helping those affected live their best lives, and the people and plans behind the modernization of our hometown airport, the second busiest cargo air hub in the world. We'll also share a special moment from our Spark Awards 2017. Ever been excited by a new idea? Inspired by watching someone lead by example? When we talk about creating change, we start by sharing the stories of everyday heroes who making a difference in their own way so we can learn and do the same. This truth is the power behind this show, which is focused on business and community leaders who are leading by example to give back, fuel change, and create new opportunities for the Mid-South. I'm Jeremy Park, and this is The Spark. They're a nonprofit cultivating future leaders for the movement in educational excellence and equity. I'm here with Chakia Parham. She is the Senior Managing Director for the Institute and First Year Core Member Support with Teach for America Memphis. And let's start with Teach for America. It's uh, an organization that's working nationally, locally, everything in between. But give us a little bit of the history and the mission for Teach for America. Of course. Uh, in 1990, uh, our founder, Wendy Kopp, was in her senior year and decided to launch an organization that said, we have these people that are going to work for these huge firms, these incredible leaders. What if, rather than the two-year internship in banking, they did two years in the classroom? And that proximity to our kids would actually launch them on a career trajectory committed to educational excellence that they otherwise would not have been on. Um, and so the, for the past over 25 years nationally and for the past 12 years in Memphis, we've brought some of the best and brightest leaders from all across the country and from Memphis into our classrooms and have continued into the work of educational equity for students. And what's neat is so they're coming from all over. They're getting immersed yeah. in our schools, but they're also getting immersed in our city and our yes. culture. And the <laughs> idea is obviously beyond the two years right. to, to keep them here. And so talk about kind of the, the neat thing of the metrics of you know who's coming, but also the fact that they are staying and they're staying in yeah. education too. Yeah, we're over 500 strong here. Um, and so we're bringing in about 150 core members each year and over 80% of them are staying in Memphis in their third year. And and staying in the classroom for a third year. And beyond that, many of them go on to be school leaders, they go on to start social entrepreneurship, um, they go on to lead systems. I can think of one person in particular. We run a summer school program that trains our teachers, but also provides students summer school here in Memphis, and particularly in Frazier. And one of our uh, leaders of our summer school worked every summer with us as an intern and is now the leader of his own charter school in our city. Um, and so we are a leadership development organization and in every moment, whether it is on our staff or in our core or a part of our alumni hood, we are trying to grow leaders who are committed to our kids for the long term. And the idea is obviously they're going into areas that um, typically are underserved. And mm -hmm. so this isn't like you're, you're bringing them here and you're putting them into a private school setting. Mm -hmm. These are going into the public schools, mm -hmm. into areas that are underserved. Mm -hmm. And so there's a strategy of not only picking the best leaders, but putting them, you know, handpicking them yeah. for these very difficult assignments too. Yeah, because right now only 6% of students in Shelby County schools are graduating college ready with an ACT of 21 or higher. And we know for a fact that it has nothing to do with the innate abilities of our students. But there's a system around our students right now that is not set up for their success. And so we're bringing in leaders to where they are absolutely most needed to be great teachers alongside great teachers, but to also have a lens to look at the system and say, how can this system be different for our students? And so I think of another set of alumni who looked at their students and saw the path to college is gonna be even more difficult financially for their students. They thought about their own lives and said, hey, I got to college on a scholarship for rugby. So I'm gonna start a rugby league at my school. So they taught, 
they started a rugby league. That's Shane and that and group, that's, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Started uh, a rugby that, league. They're Spark uh, Awards winners right there. So you, you have award winners right there. Right. And not only are the kids engaged in physical activity and building their own self-esteem, but also having a more direct and brighter path to college that is paid for now. That's um, and so our core members think really strategically and really innovatively around what are the systems around our students and how can I be an incredibly great classroom teacher, but also think about what else is needed for our students to succeed. And we're bringing in the best and brightest leaders to do exactly that. Talk about, so obviously there's a piece of this, the recruitment, but mm -hmm. then there's the development. So talk about support services and some of those nuances to make sure that when they come in, they're fully equipped and prepared mm -hmm. to take those next steps. Yeah, so our core members come to us um, in June and they start our summer school. And then that first week we are getting what they call rooted in Memphis. So they are meeting with leaders all across our city, across lots of different sectors to get a feel and taste for what is actually the, the root and the heart of what we're up against. And what are some ways that leaders across the city are already trying to solve this problem? How can we join alongside them? And then they go through a summer school program where they are teaching students um, summer school, and then they are going and leaving summer school and being taught themselves. And so their days are long during the summer, but they're getting really ready for that first day of school. And so they have those six weeks with us. And then the first day of school, you know, they get with their coaches and they have a coach that works with them one on one and in small groups to observe their classroom. Just like a coach on the sideline right. that says, hey, you, you didn't get that tackle. Our coach is saying, hey, that direction wasn't very clear um, and getting them just really better, much faster. Um, and because of the supports we provided, we're one of the top teacher preparation programs in the state. Um, and so I'm really proud of the work that not only our core members do, but also our staff do to support them during the core and also in the alumni hood. There's a piece of this too where kind of back to the keeping them, the retainment uh, side of this, is that we as the public can play a very valuable role. And I've got, you've got a ton of partnerships with different organizations. New Memphis Institute is one that comes to mind, but where mm -hmm. the public can plug in and help the teachers get plugged into the city. So yes. form friendships and mm -hmm. get them out to things like the Memphis Redbirds games and the Grizzlies and yes. using the tickets to say, hey, teachers come and let's give you a nice pat on the back for your efforts, but also too, it's a way to really galvanize them in our city. Yes. How can we help? Of course, so every year our core members get what we call batch boxes and their boxes full of lots of swag, Redbirds tickets, shirts, and gear that just make them feel like they are already at home, even when they haven't arrived. Um, and so lots of business owners offer discounts for core members um, just to make them feel more at home and more welcome. And we also, of course, need great leaders to come to our organization as well. Um, and so if you are interested in teaching and joining the movement and joining the fight, please reach out and go to teachforamericamemphis.org um, and we would love to connect with you. Nice. Well, I greatly appreciate all you're doing and uh, definitely appreciate you coming on the show and sharing. So thank you very much. Thank you. They're an organization that funds multiple sclerosis research while helping those affected live their best lives. I'm here with the president of the National MS Society, the Mid-South Chapter, David Haddock. And let's start with when you talk about multiple sclerosis, MS, what is MS? So MS is a disease of the neurological system where your own immune system attacks your body, attacks the nerves. So if you thought of it like a wire and how that wire is insulated with rubber on the inside, the disease attacks the rubber and then eventually gets the rubber breaks down, which is called myelin actually in the brain. And it gets down to the root of the nerve, which is what causes the symptoms of MS. Gotcha. And I know that you know when you, it's not something typically you can necessarily see and just say, oh, that person has MS. Many times it's someone in a wheelchair, <clears throat> but they're going through all sorts of pain, discomfort, numbness, dizziness. There's a lot of things that play into this. MS is known as the invisible disease for that very reason. And it's, it's one thing that's just so difficult to talk about with different people because it affects each person so differently. One person may have problems with numbness in their, in their limbs, vision issues, um, balance problems, or they may have all of that. You know, I think when you look at the nervous system and the brain, you know, it's just so complex and it affects us in so many different ways. That's why, the, that's why this disease is so hard to link track from person to person. It's just so different. Talk about numbers, how many U.S., I know that women are typically more affected than men. They are, um, so na nationally, or actually worldwide, it's about 2.5 million um, that we currently believe have MS. And we're doing a prevalence study right now, so those numbers may change in the next six months, and we'll come back and talk about that if they do. And we have 10,000 that we serve here in Tennessee. Um, and yes, it is more prevalent in women, almost by 50%. Um, and no one really knows why that is. Um, another interesting statistic is it's more prevalent in cold 
regions. It's hmm. less prevalent in warm regions. So there's a lot of things that go into play with what causes MS and who gets it more, and that's why research funding is so important for this disease. And you are, National MS Society is the number one funder of research. So talk about that, because I mean, that's <clears throat> a huge piece of this. Oh, definitely. We are the number one global funder of multiple sclerosis research in the world. And over the years, we've contributed over a billion dollars in research dollars. Um, and a lot of that money for us here in Tennessee does stay here in Tennessee. Um, I think it was over $2 million in the last few years. We give money here to St. Jude's in Memphis to do research and over in Nashville and, and Vanderbilt. And the research is just varied. Um, some of it's cellular research where they look at different differences between uh, people with MS and without MS and trying to track down you know, what that looks like. And in, in Vanderbilt, some of it's imaging um, with MRI and trying to diagnose the disease earlier and seeing what medications work and what don't work. So a lot of fascinating things happening here locally in research. Well, when you talk about the research, I mean, that's what's leading to new protocols, innovations. There's now, what, 16 different therapies that didn't exist before, so there are. the research is paying big dividends. 20 years ago, there was not a single therapy for multiple sclerosis, and now there's 16, and it is all because of this effort, um, and not just us, the collaboration. I mean, sure. that's one thing that I love about the National MS Society, is we can co collaborate, collaborate with so many people across the globe. And it's a fantastic partnership and getting the awareness up in Memphis is really what we're focusing on right now um, to try and get more people to understand what MS is and how you can support this effort. Well, and talk about, because you have support services, there's a, a number that is available from eight to six that people can call that will plug them into research and, and uh, support services and all those resources. And then you do have, you have people here that are creating support networks and mobilizing, so to speak. So, so talk about those two sides. Yes, yeah, so one of the most important things we do is plug people in. So if you're diagnosed with MS or if you know someone who has MS, the best way to get help now um, is by calling this number. It's, it's called the National Navigator, the MS Navigator Program. Um, and the number is 1-800-344-4867. And there's professionals that work there every single day that are trained to, in all the aspects of MS, in our, who our providers in care are, how to plug patients in with the best um, things that they need help with. That's the number one way to get in touch and to help fill those needs that you have. And talk about the council here locally. So we started the Nem Memphis Community Council in the past year, um, basically as a group of volunteers, a real grassroots effort to get the awareness up in Memphis, to help connect people better, to help serve people living with MS better here in Memphis, and to also obviously raise more money for the research efforts so we can finally bring an end to this disease. And then I know that there's a, a number of special events, including a big bike ride. Um, you do a lot <clears throat> around kind of the physical activity of getting people out together. So talk about just the, the bike MS and the FedEx Rock and Ride. Definitely, the FedEx Rock and Ride is in its 34th year, one of the longest running rides in, of any that we have in the country. Um, it raises over $100,000 every year. Our great partners with FedEx and Cliff Tillman and that whole group over there have been fantastic with us. Um, and we're really excited about it this year because we've added a short route to the ride. Uh, that's a 30 mile route that's been really a lot, of, a lot of new buzz has been going around it and a lot of new people are signing up because they're not you know, cut out to ride that 75 or 100 miles. Well, this is more family friendly. It's something yeah. that you can go out, not necessarily, I mean, it's, it's a casual ride. So you can go out there and enjoy the camaraderie, your family, and really go out there together and enjoy it. It's a great two day event. If you've never done it, I highly recommend. And then we also have our Walk MS event, which is huge, so well attended here in Memphis. The passion around these people, I mean, it's just amazing to see. Uh, it's where everybody in the MS community comes together as a family. And that event is April the 27th this year. And even this past year, when it was pouring down rain, we still had over 300 people come out and walk with us. Wow. So it's a, it's a really neat experience to be seen. So what are the easy ways? I mean, obviously you've got the navigator, but when you talk about us locally helping, getting involved, where do we start? So I think the best way to start is if you're interested in being involved with the National MS Society, call our office. Call and ask for me. I'll find a way to plug you into the work we're doing here. Our community council is also a great avenue to get involved with, and many of those who are serving on that, including yourself, has helped us out a lot with it. Um, they're looking, we're looking for those people that want to be involved and want to open doors and help the community with the, you know, raise the level of awareness we have in Memphis and the support. Well, Dave, I greatly appreciate all you do and for coming on the show. Thank Thanks, you very Jeremy. Much. We appreciate you.
The Spark Awards annually recognize and celebrate individuals and organizations that have made outstanding contributions to the community. This year's recipient of the Education Leadership Award is Principal Darla Young of Havenview Middle School. My name is Darla Young. I'm the principal at Havenview Middle School. This is my second year at Havenview. This is my going into my 13th year in education. I spent 11 years at Whitehaven High, five years as a teacher, and six years as an assistant principal at Whitehaven High. And then I kind of just went around the corner and um, started at Havenview Middle. But I'm also a product of Whitehaven, uh, the community, because I went from Oakshire Elementary to Havenview Middle to Whitehaven High. So I'm still at home in my alma mater. And what makes you so passionate about education? Knowledge is what makes us and leads us. It determines our character. It actually produces um, the individual and citizen we are today. So I feel like if I can go and help someone's child and even my child in my community, I feel like I'm doing a, um, a great service back to what, who's helped me be who I am today. So much of education, we talk about success and what you're having, it's, it's building a culture of excellence. I always start off first with my community because without the community, a, a school could perish and you need your stakeholders and the community support to back you. And with me being an actual um, citizen, because I still live around the corner from the school at Havenview, so all my home and my children that I have I also go to Havenview and Whitehaven. But with my community piece, if I can get my community and my parents to back me and support me, then I feel like uh, there's no mountain we can't climb or anything we can't um, accomplish. But as long as you get the parent, then you work your way in and you start with your teachers. And my teachers and my community, I let them voice their opinion. I listen, meaning I want their voices to be heard. I actually let them do a lot of ownership of the decisions that we made. Because Havenview is in this um, new zone called the Whitehaven Empowerment Zone. And we let our parents and our stakeholders drive and lead the decisions that are made into the school. So once my community and then my teachers have ownership, then I have to go back in and motivate my students to why we're doing what we're doing. And I want them to know, you know, without you all, the community does not exist. So I have to, you know, keep them motivated to why we do what we do. And I know you burn the candle on all ends and you even foster children over 50. So talk about being a foster parent, why that's so important to you. Um, well, my parents started as foster parents, and then as um, I became into the education field, then I bought my first home, and I was like, this house is quite big. So then I started with one child, and then I said, oh, we can help someone else, because the children of this generation, they just want the attention and love. They're not asking for, you know, material things. They don't really care for that. They just want somebody to listen. Um, show them affection and say, okay, I'm here to help you despite where your circumstances are and where they're coming from. You're still going to let me in your house and love me despite what they've told you. And when I say that, I mean just the um, knowledge base that has given to me. Yes, I'm still going to help. I just ad I adopted one of them. So it's kind of like, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. No matter what your problem or past or your current situation is, there's always a will, there's a way. They're our hometown airport. They're the second busiest cargo hub in the world. A lot of good stuff going on with Memphis International Airport. We're here with the Director of Strategic Marketing, Communications, and Customer Service, Glenn Thomas, with Memphis Shelby County Airport Authority, but fondly known, obviously, for all of us as MIM, Memphis International Airport. So That's let's right. start, you. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of good stuff going on in terms of the, the numbers increasing, fares decreasing. So mm -hmm. what puts a smile on your face at this point? Let's start there with the good stuff going on with MIM. Well, I guess one of the most significant things is that we've embarked on a new modernization program. We are completely revamping the B concourse. Uh, construction has begun on that. It's going to be a three-year project, but it's really going to change Memphis travel. And talk about, because you've got moving walkways, it's going to be wider, more natural light. There's a lot of neat things that go with this. Correct. Uh, essentially, passengers are going to have more room to move. Uh, there's going to be a lot more natural lighting. Uh, they are going to have new amenities, uh, children's play area, a stage for music. And what we're really doing is funneling the passengers through a, a not a concentrated area, but through one concourse. And by doing that, they will have exposure to all of the different vendors. Right now, everyone's kind of spread out. 
Uh, and this really allows us to streamline things, but still, you know, uh, have an optimal travel process. Yeah. Talk about music. I think that's kind of a cool thing. We talk about the stage is you're well known for having artists coming in there. So when, when passengers are coming through, they're greeted by live music. Yeah, that's something we've done in the past. Um, we have had live music. The Memphis Symphony comes on a regular basis, but we also want to have an actual stage there so we can give people a proper Memphis welcome or a Memphis send off. And so, you know, I mentioned the onset, but uh, the, the neat thing is the airfare is going down, bigger planes, more seats, more opportunities. You're bringing on a, a lot more um, opportunities just in general to fly different places like Denver. Talk about some of the good stuff that's going on. Yeah, and what we're trying to do is increase air service. And sometimes that can be a new destination that can also be a larger plane. Uh, sometimes if those planes are filling up, the air carrier is gonna say, you know what, we need to bring in a larger plane, increase the number of seats for a particular destination. And we've seen that with several of our destinations. Um, we're adding new options. Uh, Southwest began Denver flights in October and not only is that increased connectivity to Denver, but it also uh, opens up the West Coast, you know, it's easier to connect out there. Um, Southwest also moving to three times daily on their Dallas route uh, early in 2019. And then emplanements, I know that's a, a big thing that you look at statistically. Describe what emplanements mean and then obviously what percentage we're up at this point. Well, an emplanement essentially means a passenger getting on a plane. It's an industry standard term that we utilize to measure growth and uh, the level of passenger traffic. And we have continually been growing in that respect. And, you know, going back to our hub days, we were primarily a transfer airport. What that means is three quarters of our passengers weren't coming and going as far as Memphis is concerned. They were connecting in Memphis, moving on to their ultimate destination. When Delta pulled its hub out, suddenly we became almost 100 percent and what's called an origin and destination or an O and D airport. So we're measuring that O and D traffic. And right now that traffic is rivaling uh, the traffic that we had in the hub days in terms of O and D. So there is many people coming and going uh, to and from Memphis as there were back in the hub era. Wow. Talk about on your end, um, I think there's a, a technology piece of this that's really cool is you have a website, Fly Memphis, um, that people can go to and you can see all the different flight options. So as you're looking at, hey, you know, where can I go as a destination, mm -hmm. you can literally see everything right there. Right. Uh, our website, flymemphis.com, is really the only website that has every Memphis flight. And I say that because there are some airlines that do not list with the aggregator services. They are not on Expedia. Right. So in, in Allegiant or uh, Southwest, they only, uh, you can only book tickets through their site. So you can go to our website. We've got a map with all the nonstop destinations that are available. You click on the city and it'll give you the airlines that serve that city. You can click on a link and go to that airline's website and book your ticket from there. Nice. And then, you know, on, on your end too, talk about just where all this is going in terms of, um, you know, what, what are some of your success metrics? I mean, obviously, emplanements and trying to see those still rise, the modernization. Above and beyond that, what else are you looking at? Is these are the things that we want to make sure that we're focused on for tomorrow? Well, certainly we want to see the modernization project through. Um, it's going to be a long process. Right now, all the airlines are operating on the A and C concourses while construction takes place. Um, there'll be many steps along the way in that process, but it is uh, scheduled to be completed in 2021. So the main thing um, from our standpoint is really serving as that middleman, making sure that passengers are having an optimal experience. Um, for example, at the airport, we don't handle baggage. That's done 100% by the airlines, but sometimes we're the sounding board for, for passengers. So we try to get them the help that they need. Um, it's just a matter of taking care of our passengers. And then when that, you know, the new concourse opens, we think that people will have a whole new travel experience here. We can't, uh, you know, not mention it, but the second largest or second busiest cargo hub in the world. I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, obviously tied to FedEx here locally, but being the second busiest cargo hub in the world has got to be a very cool distinction. Definitely, and there's a tremendous amount of activity. So we're second in the world, but we're also the uh, busiest cargo airport in North America. Um, anyone who is around the airport at night can hear the the steady uh, buzz of those FedEx planes taking off. Um, 
But not only does, is FedEx huge for our local economy, but it also helps the commercial carriers because they pay the, the vast bulk of the landed weight. And that helps us keep our rates down for the commercial uh, passengers as well. Which then comes back to help us. So that's right. That's it makes awesome. it easier to recruit new airlines. So you mentioned flymemphis.com, but talk about just where we should follow the conversation, social media, website, where do we go to, to learn more and make sure that we're uh, taking those flights? Well, we have an active social media presence. Um, and again, our website is, is really uh, uh, kind of the crux of our connectivity with passengers, flymemphis.com. We also have a frequent Parker program. Many people may not be aware of that. It's called Memperks. You can go to memperks.com or our website at flymemphis.com, sign up, it's free, you earn points every time you park at the airport and then you can cash those points in for free parking. It's super convenient. Well, Glenn, thanks for all you do, greatly appreciate it, love the Thank airport you. and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, I appreciate it. Progress is in the air here in Memphis in the Mid-South. According to 901renews.com, there are more than 260 proposed, planned, and under construction projects with an estimated investment value of more than $12 billion in our city. As we saw in this month's episode, our Memphis International Airport is embarking on a new multi-phase, multi-year modernization plan that includes improved passenger experience, increased flight options, falling average airfare, and larger aircraft. Then organizations like Teach for America and the National MS Society Mid-South Chapter are leading progress through people, through the classroom and our education system, and through research, innovation, and support services for those who need help and are battling diseases like MS. Progress is coming in many forms, and when we work together to power the good, it can lead to great things for our city. Thank you for watching The Spark. To learn more about each of the guests, to watch past episodes, and to share your stories of others leading by example, visit WKNO.org and click on the link for The Spark. We look forward to seeing you next month, and we hope that you'll join with us in creating a spark for the Mid-South. Just like having relevant and accurate information is necessary to make sound, hiring, and lending decisions, being engaged in our community is important. Datafax is proud to support the positives and be a sponsor of The Spark. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance is honored to serve the Memphis community for over 60 years. We've always focused on supporting our community and believe in promoting the positives, encouraging engagement, and leading by example. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance is proud to be a presenting sponsor of The Spark.